community. Now at 7. A contagious but common virus impacting young children. This year it's spreading earlier than normal. Plus, Maui's police chief joins us in studio. How the department has dealt with the concealed carry chain. And how he's navigated his first year as Maui's top cop. Also keeping Hawaii clean, green, and livable. Details about a free tree giveaway this weekend. We're working for Hawaii. The KHOAG News at 7 on KHI starts now. Good evening and thank you for joining us on Hawaii's only live local newscast at 7. Well, it starts like a typical cold, but in some cases, RSV could have a severe impact on a young child to where they need to go to the hospital. That's what state health officials are seeing. RSV cases are rising early in the season. Cheyenne Sibley with more in tonight's top story. The State Department of Health says the number of positive tests for RSV this season so far has been 2,070, and this does not include the many who haven't tested. And if we look at the data for the state of Hawaii, we do see increases in both the number of tests being done and the percentage of tests that are coming back positive. So right now, about one in four tests being done for RSV is coming back positive. Doctors suggest to be cautious of kids ages newborn to five. One Oahu parent said a small cough from his 16-month-old son turned scary fast in February 2020. My wife had taken him, him in um, to the pediatrician, and they were like, you have to go now. Um, they called for an ambulance to, to rush him over to Kiolani because his, his oxygen numbers were super low. What they thought was the flu or COVID turned out to be RSV, putting their child in the hospital for three days. This year, they are thankful to know what to look out for. One of the biggest things we, we kind of learn, especially with our doctors, even though they may feel better, their body might not be fully, fully better. So to still keep on it until we notice, um, you know, those prolonged periods of time where they, they seem a lot healthier, not just a little spurt here and there. Another parent is glad they caught it early. He started to feel better after the first day of antibiotics and the nebulizer treatment. Um, he breathes so much easier, so much easier now, um, and he's sleeping through the night. Although there is no vaccine for RSV, doctors still suggest to take precautionary measures, get flu shots and COVID vaccinations to prevent additional sickness. Cheyenne Sibley, KHON2 News, working for Hawaii. Dozens of questionable transactions and millions of dollars wasted. That's what a new Office of Hawaiian Affairs audit has found. Chrissy Tamashiro has more. The audit of Office of Hawaiian Affairs contracts and spending sparked concern after flagging 38 questionable transactions between 2012 to 2016. With funding from the state legislature, OHA says a follow-up audit conducted by a national accounting company confirmed those concerns. The Plant Moran report finalized last week found 22 of the 38 CLA identified transactions with evidence of fraud, waste, and abuse. OHA says those 22 transactions amounted to nearly $8 million. When we look back, we saw that there was a culture that made fraud, waste, and abuse easy to do at OHA. Some of the examples are an organization that was given millions of dollars for which no clear work product was given, for which there were no receipts even for the money. Now the board of nine trustees will need to meet and decide whether to hand these findings over to law enforcement. We need to seek legal recourse. We need to pursue prosecution wherever appropriate. The people of Hawaii, the beneficiaries of OHA, and the citizens of our state deserve to have all funds reclaimed, if at all possible. OHA says it's implemented tighter systems to prevent fraud from happening, like establishing a financial transparency website and eliminating CEO-initiated sponsorships. OHA says it's working on moving toward a new era of transparency and accountability. If you have pilikia, if you have information, bring it now because we are seeking accountability and those who will continue this investigation. Chrissy Tomashiro, KH12 News, working for Hawaii.
The State Office of Elections has released the last printout from Tuesday's vote, and there will be two recounts in, ra in two races. A recount will be held in the Makaha Senate race, where incumbent Democrat Miley Shimabukuro is ahead by 71 votes against Republican Samantha DeCourt. There will also be a recount in the Kauai Council member race, in which Bill Billy DaCosta was ahead of Ross Kagawa by 158 votes. The deadline to announce the results of the recount is tomorrow. Tuesday's election in Hawaii was either the worst or for turnout or among the best, and it depends on whether you look at the count of votes cast or the percentage of registered voters who participated. Either way, there's big room for improvement to make sure people's votes count. In a record low for a Hawaii general election, only 48.4% of registered voters participated. We didn't have the most exciting election uh, as far as issues here in Hawaii. I think most people realized uh, that several races, especially the bigger ones, were, were pretty much set. And I think that that, that hurt uh, the, the turnout. But turnout as a percent is a bit deflated because the denominator in the equation, registered voters, is supersized. More than 100,000 people on the rolls are inactive voters, many not even residents anymore. But by federal law, they cannot be purged from the rolls for several inactive cycles. And if you look at number of votes cast in this election, it actually comes in sixth highest of all time, with more than 417,000 people casting ballots. That's really good to hear. Um, you know, we, we take a lot of guff down at the, at, at, the, at the commission and, of course, the Office of Elections does, you know, on, on all mail-in and how horrible it is. It's, it's really a, a great system, <clears throat> and it's, a, it's an extremely safe system. As we first reported yesterday, there was a bit of a pushback this cycle against early voting, with more than 10,000 people lining up on Election Day and around 100,000 mail and drop box ballots coming in on or just before the final cutoff. That's a reversal in a trend toward early voting that had been building for years. How can officials make Election Day voting easier? Those decisions are really up to the county. The, the county's involved. It, it's, it's not the state's um, Office of Elections decision, and it's certainly not the commission, but um, they're going to have to look at that. There's always things that we can look at uh, to, to try to improve things, and uh, we are going to do that. We will always do that. We'll do that after every election, and we're going to see if there's any bumps in the road, and if there are, we'll smooth them out. The general election had some notable outcomes. Republicans won five new spots in the legislature, four of them unseating Democratic Party incumbents. I was a little bit surprised. You know, even Ben Cayetano said a couple of years ago, we need a loyal opposition. Republican Duke Iona got more than 151,000 votes around the number he got against Abercrombie in 2010. But Josh Green's victory in that race was historic. Green earned the top spot for votes received by a Hawaii gubernatorial candidate ever at nearly 260,000. He comes in second for margin of victory in vote count, just behind his predecessor David Ige and just above Linda Lingle. All of them received around 100,000 votes more than their closest competitors. And Green comes in third for victory margin, just behind Ige and Lingle, as a percent spread above their opponents. Thank you, Gina. And tomorrow is Veterans Day, honoring those who served in the armed forces. If you have a day off, you might want to bring a jacket if you're headed outdoors. Justin Cruz joining us now with the forecast. Jess? Our winds are becoming northerly. They're somewhat northerly right now, but they're not very, very strong. Single digits for at least most of the eastern half of the state. We're in the teens for Kauai, Oahu, as well as Lanai City. But these northern, easterly winds are going to veer more northerly tomorrow, and that's why tomorrow is going to be mostly dry and cool. The humidity is dropping, but it's only going to be for a short amount of time because these northerly winds will start to veer back to the northeast on Saturday. So we basically got one day of cool weather. Temperatures are going to drop a few degrees. Showers are going to be very limited. We're seeing a little bit tonight for Maui County, but that's pretty much about it. Everywhere else is just isolated showers, and it's really looking nice for tomorrow. Some areas 
will struggle to hit 80 degrees. Most likely, those town spots will. Upper elevations might not even hit 80 degrees, and the overnight lows are going to be in the upper 60s. So a cool Friday in through a beautiful weekend forecast. Back to you both. Thank you, Jess. Up next, Maui's police chief joins us in studio. How the department has dealt with the concealed carry change and how he is navigating his first year as Maui's top cop. But first, we have a special tribute to our nation's veterans with stories from around the nation and here at home. Tune in tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. right here on KHI for Veterans Voices. You can also watch it online at khon2.com. You're watching the KHON2 News at 7 on KHI with Bridget Namata and Gina Mangieri. Welcome back. Joining me now from the beautiful Valley Isle is Maui Police Chief John Pelletier here in studio at KHON2. Chief, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me, Gina. Well, Maui was the first county to issue concealed carry permits after the U.S. Supreme Court mandated our state and others change their procedures. How was that able to happen so efficiently on Maui when other counties took a little bit longer or, in one case, still haven't even issued any yet? Well, when the, when the Bruin decision came down and the, the, some of the states had to make those changes, we had some tweaking to do, but we already had a CCW permit process in place. And so we simply enacted what we already had. Uh, we had incredible leadership. Our records manager, Kat Pashal, she uh, had the foresight to anticipate some of these challenges and we started to line these things up. Something interesting to think about, before the decision we had six applications for the calendar year. Since the decision we've had almost 500. And so we needed to make sure that we were able to anticipate as these things were, were, were bu uh, building up. Right now we're at about 120 days or so from the time you put the application in to the time that uh, we, we can get the uh, application process. And uh, year to date we have uh, 14 that we've issued. All right. Well, how are your officers prepared for the challenges that might come along with more people carrying firearms legally in public? We in law enforcement, we have an obligation to make sure that our members of, of our agency are, are the best trained, the most prepared to handle any situation, and that includes those that are carrying firearms. But my bigger concern as the chief is to make sure that the 250 firearms that we've seized year to date, those individuals that shouldn't be having firearms or are using firearms to co commit felonious crimes or violent crimes 
aren't able to do so. Well, our viewers in Maui County will appreciate hearing your perspectives on taking over a department from a chief who left under some difficult circumstances. You come in, a new place, new chief, <laughs> new place for you. How are you navigating the leadership challenges that go along with changing location, being the new boss in a department that's had its troubles? That's a really great question, Gina. I appreciate the way you asked it. And let me just say this. Challenges are opportunities. And Maui PD has incredible opportunities to progress and to grow and to be a model agency, not just for the state, but for the nation. And we're going to get there. And one of the things that uh, the profession has done, the policing profession, is they haven't really liked change so much. And I'll just use bulletproof vests as an example. So MPD, uh, we mandate in uniform that officers wear their vests. But there are numerous police departments nationally, internationally, that don't. And we know that bulletproof vests save lives. But folks don't want to change. And so, but we know that change is healthy, is good, and that's how we grow it. And one of the things that's uh, imperative that we do in policing is that we adapt 21st century policing principles. And these are uh, almost 10 years old, but there's six pillars of them. And one of, the, one of them is trust and transparency, and another one is community partnership and, and engagement. We've actually knocked on doors, and we've asked citizens, what do you want from the police department? How are we doing for you? What changes can we do to help you feel safer and more secure in your community? And it's gone over very well. And are you finding that that approach, as you can get to people one by one, is changing the mood internally, changing the receptivity internally in the places where it was icy? You know, absolutely, because the, the more that we spend time, the more we know each other, the more we understand each other, the more we build together, the more we grow together, uh, the stronger, the tighter, the closer we're going to be. And we're, we, we've got our best days ahead of us. And, and we came out of a, a couple tumultuous years with COVID and the events from the Midwest of, of the country and, and some of the events that we, we saw in 2020. Uh, and we're, we're just going to move forward because this is an incredible profession. Well, MPD is pioneering rapid deploy that's going to allow for video and text 911. It's really quite incredible. First county to do it here. Uh, how's that going to be a game changer? It is a game changer, and, and, and it works like this, is, is you can actually text 911. And if you're a victim of domestic violence, let's just say, and you can't make that phone call because the suspect could hear, you can text and you can say that you need help and where you're at. And there's up to 70 different languages that you can text from. You can live video where you're at, and it'll capture the video so first responders can come to you. Maui County Dispatch, the, the, the dispatching that we have at MPD, we're responsible for dispatching not just police, but also fire and medical personnel. And so that'll help us get the services to those that are most in need quicker and more efficiently. Anything else you want to say to the people at home on Maui? Yes, I'd like to say uh, we're hiring. Come join us. If, if you're looking for an, an extremely exciting opportunity, if you're looking to be part of something bigger than yourself, the policing profession offers incredible opportunities. We respond to people in need in crisis and crime and strife. We have opportunities for both sworn and non-sworn. So if you want to be a dispatcher or a member of the CSI and investigate crime scenes, we'd love to have you. And the website is MauiPolice.com. All right, hopefully you find some good people out there to serve the county. Thank you. Well, Chief Pletcher, thank you so much for joining us. And Bridget, we'll send it back to you. Thank you, Gina. Great to have you here for the first time on the News at 7, Chief Pelletier. The Honolulu City Council is set to debate where guns can and cannot be carried in public. A measure to create sensitive places will be heard at a special council session on November 29th at 10 a.m. The public is allowed to attend this meeting. Well, conditions are looking cool for Veterans Day. Stick around. Justin Cruz returns with the full forecast as we head into Aloha Friday. First, here's a look at current conditions in Honolulu.
supported vision. Visit seeforalifetime.org. With KHO and two weather, Justin Cruz. It's kind of a Friday for some people that have the day off tomorrow, but either way, weather's going to be great. Traffic most likely will be just fine as we enter this three day Veterans Day weekend. No weather threats for the islands, no storms to speak of, just high pressure. And of course, with those trade winds that have been moving through, that's pushing in a few showers. Not so much, though. It's actually, you know, it's actually drier than normal. So for this week and into the weekend, nightly and morning windward showers with plenty of sunshine all the way through Sunday and beyond. Let's talk about the rain and the winds. First off, don't expect much, even in terms of windward showers. We are seeing a few tonight. But these winds that are really racing in from the north tomorrow, those northerly winds are what's going to give us that uh, coolness, that crispness. Now, don't expect it to be super cold or anything like that. It's just a few degrees drop, but the humidity drops significantly, and that's what you're really going to feel, or the lack of humidity, I should say. Windward showers are moving mostly through Maui County, but everywhere else it's kind of hit or miss. Isolated showers at best for the garden now. Very, very dry conditions for Oahu. Did see a few showers. There's some offshore, but they'll be racing through later tonight. Uh, the wettest county definitely today uh, is Maui County. You can see those showers for East Maui, even earlier this evening in the Wailuku and Kahului area. And even the Big Island, not seeing too much in terms of showers. They are starting to fill in, especially uh, in the Hamakua coastline area. But again, quick passing, light to moderate stuff. Three to five east and north, flat to two for the west, south shores at one to three. So tomorrow, a cool Friday. And then we have a few showers uh, on Saturday morning. It should start to dry up Saturday afternoon in two. A sunny Sunday. Let's head on over to Las Vegas, see how things over there on the Ninth Island. Here's Ted Florendo. Hi, everyone. Ted Florendo here with your Ninth Island forecast. An earlier look at fabulous Las Vegas, clear skies after the storm we had a few days ago. Now we're back to sunny skies. And temperatures still, however, remain on the chilly side. More clouds for tomorrow. We'll be in the high 50s for tomorrow, but we should be at 70 degrees for this time of the year. So you'll need the jacket out here for sure. No rain, though, in sight for tomorrow. Or this weekend, too. We'll see sunny skies for the weekend. Temperatures still hovering in the high 50s. And that goes for next week, too, as we still stay below normal in those mid-50s. I'm Tim Florendo, and that is your Night Island Forecast. Have a great night. You too. Thank you, Ted. The Rainbow Warrior basketball team opens their season tomorrow night. Rob DeMello has a preview next in sports. Plus, Hawaii's Marcus Mariota playing under the Thursday night lights in the NFL. Could he guide the Falcons back to 500 on the season?
ON2 News is sponsored by Haleakala Solar and Roofing. With KHON2 Sports, Rob DeMello. How's it going, everybody? Entering the NFL's week number 10, despite a 4-5 and five record, Hawaii's Marcus Mariota and his Atlanta Falcons remained in a tie for first place in the NFC South Division and on Thursday night football looked to keep that pace against the Panthers. St. Louis graduate making the 71st start of his eight-year career and all that experience was needed to keep composure through an extremely rough first three quarters as the Carolina defensive line dominated for majority of the game, forcing nine quarterback hurries with three sacks on Mariota's first 25 dropbacks. But through all that, Mariota's second touchdown pass with two minutes and 58 seconds remaining cut Carolina's lead to just seven. And Atlanta would get the ball back. But the storyline continued as Mariota was then sacked two more times on the final drive. 25-15 Panthers the final. Falcons fall to four and six. Bucks now take over first place in the division by half a game. Back here at home, the final three-game stretch for the University of Hawaii football team gets underway this weekend as UH hosts the first of back-to-back -back home games starting with the defending Mountain West champs of Utah State. Now, Rainbow Warriors are winless in the series dating back to 2010. That spans four different head coaches at UH. Timmy Chang will get his first crack at the Aggies on Saturday. Kickoff is set for six, and it will be televised on Spectrum Sports pay-per-view. For a complete preview, click the Go Bows tab on our website. KHON2.com. Elsewhere on the gridiron, the HHSAA State Football Championship Tournament quarterfinals will be played this weekend in both Division I and Division II. And of course, we'll get you ready for the showdowns on Cover 2, Hawaii High School Football Weekly. That's every Thursday night at 9 30 right here on KHON2. And remember, voting for the Cover 2 awards remains open at KHON2.com. Season 10 award show will run in the special one hour season finale on Thanksgiving night. Hitting the rewind button to Wednesday night, where for the second straight season, the Chaminade women's volleyball team locked up the Pacific West Conference title, winning their 22nd match of the season in California, giving the Silver Swords back to back crowns for the first time in program history. While head coach Kahala Kabbalah's Hoke secured career victory number 180, passing Glennie Adams for tops all time in the program. Swords claimed the automatic bid into the NC2A tournament. Selection show is set for Sunday evening, so stay with KHON2 Sports for continuing coverage. And over in Manoa, the University of Hawaii men's basketball team will hit the court on Friday night, opening their season with the 57th annual Outrigger Rainbow Classic. Now, UH enters the three game tournament with high expectations, picked second in the Big West Conference preseason poll, having nine players returning from a season ago. And according to head coach Ron Ganat, an early test of attrition is welcomed. You're thrown in the fire because you're playing three games in four days against different styles, different combinations. It could be big, small, zone, man, press. And so, just like that, you know, this early in the year, uh, I'm looking forward to that challenge. I'm looking forward to how our guys can handle that. I mean, like we talked about, teams have been playing maybe a game a week in a scrimmage or exhibition format, and they don't go right to a three and four. So, we're doing that, and uh, I'm excited about that. Our guys are excited about that, and I'm looking forward to the challenge. Yeah. Something I brought up uh, before last week was the, the smell of the popcorn in the stand, and I had it, it, they didn't make popcorn last week. So, I mean, I'm excited to walk in here and, and get that feeling. And, uh, you know, we've been practicing so hard and to, to, get, that, to get that one win on the, on the, on the column this week is, is the goal, and can't wait to make that happen. Again, Rainbow Classic starts on Friday night against Mississippi Valley State. That's followed by games against Eastern Washington on Sunday and Yale on Monday. All three outings will be televised on Spectrum Sports. There's your look at sports. Back to you. Thanks, Rob. So glad to have the basketball season back. Still to come in our next half hour, Florida has been hit again with another hurricane weeks after Ian devastated the Sunshine State. A look at the damage done this time by Nicole. Plus, his term is soon coming to an end. Governor David Ige looks back on his eight years in office. We'll have these stories and more when you join us for our next half hour.
federally insured by the NCUA. We're working for Hawaii. You're watching the KHON2 News. Welcome back to the News at 7. I'm Bridget Namata. And I'm Gina Mangieri. Recapping tonight's headlines, the health department says cases of influenza and RSV are rising in Hawaii earlier than usual. While RSV is common with kids, it can be severe in young keiki when the virus impacts their breathing. Although there is no vaccine for RSV, doctors still suggest to take precautionary measures, get flu shots, and COVID vaccinations to prevent additional sickness. An audit looking into the Office of Hawaiian Affairs flagged 38 questionable transactions over the course of four years. A follow-up audit by a national firm determined 22 of those transactions amounted to nearly $8 million. The board of nine trustees will need to meet and decide whether to hand these findings over to law enforcement. Turning to weather, cool conditions for Veterans Day tomorrow. Justin Cruz has more in weather. Yeah, it's a Hawaiian-style cool, not a mainland-style cool for sure, but things are going to be a few degrees cooler, and for some spots, the overnight low is going to dip into the 60s. We're seeing some windward showers, mostly for Maui County and the Big Island tonight. More may fill in tonight, but we're really not expecting too much in the way of any kind of windward showers. Overnight low, at least in Honolulu, 72, 82 the high tomorrow. Rain chances tomorrow morning, bright and early for your hopefully day off, is very low. 16% for Hilo, 5% for Kona, 24 Kahului, single digits. Molokai as well as Lanai, same with Oahu, and on uh, Kauai, 20%. Princeville is the highest we got. So those are very low figures for rainfall. And this weekend, don't expect much rain either. Maybe Saturday morning showers into a dry Saturday afternoon and evening and a sunny Sunday. Back to you, Gina. Thank you, Justin. Tropical Storm Nicole sent Florida homes toppling into the Atlantic Ocean today. The storm is being blamed for the deaths of two people. And it was the first November hurricane to make landfall in Florida in nearly four decades. Xavier Walton has more. As Nicole moves north, Florida still feeling the effects. Homes on the brink of falling into the Atlantic Ocean. This is his backyard. It has gone. It is completely gone. Beach erosion threatening structures up and down the Treasure Coast. Wind knocking out power to thousands. Thursday, the Orange County Sheriff's Office confirming two people dead after officials say they were electrocuted by a downed power line. Near Cape Canaveral, sparks from a transformer. The Kennedy Space Center just miles away. Nicole forcing NASA to delay its Artemis 1 moon mission. It is shocking. Tyler Paul lives on Vero Beach near where the rare November storm made landfall. We went to spend the night with a friend on the other side of the island. I mean, you were that worried? Mm hmm. We, di we didn't want to wake up in the night and find water coming into our place. Thank God. Two words from a retired Vero Beach firefighter who says it could have been worse. Oh, you can't bite that. And his dog named Superman knew something was up. For three days, he's been very nervous and can't seem to relax. And I, maybe they feel the pressure, but he knew there was something that was different in the air. Well, a federal judge in Texas has blocked President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. The program was already on hold while a federal appeals court considers a separate lawsuit by several states challenging it. The debt forgiveness plan would provide millions of borrowers up to $20,000 in relief. As of late last month, more than 22 million borrowers applied for debt relief. It is unclear what happens next. With less than a month left in office, Governor David Ige reflects on his legacy and his accomplishments. He sat down with Manolo Morales and shared what he plans to do next. After eight years spent running the state, Governor Ige says he'll let history decide what his legacy is, but he is proud of what he and his administration accomplished. His response to the pandemic received a fair amount of criticism, but in the end, he says it was all about keeping people safe and Hawaii was among the best in the country in doing that. Hawaii clearly was number one in the country. We had amongst the lowest infection rates and death rates in the country. I know that every single death is tragic, but um, we did better than uh, anyone else. He adds that the state has made great strides in building affordable housing and dealing with the homeless problem, but admits that there's plenty of work that still needs to be done. 
we continue to see homeless individuals, but at least we have the programs in place. We are beginning to make progress and we are seeing a reduction each and every year. As far as what he'll do next, the governor says he'll work in something that involves public policy, but probably not run for office, although he says he won't rule it out completely. The one thing about public service, Manolo, is that it is an opportunity to really help a lot of people. And, and you're helping people every single day. And that's um, not something that you get in many jobs. He does plan to take some time off first and do some traveling with First Lady Dawn Ige. He says places on their bucket list are Patagonia and New Zealand. Manolo Morales, KHON2 News, working for Hawaii. New numbers out show consumer prices aren't rising as quickly as before, indicating that inflation could be slowing. Officials acknowledge prices are still too high and put many Americans in a tough position. Bryce Moore reports. While easing inflation is good news, it doesn't mean we're out of the woods yet. The inflation is when pricing is going up. Now, if we're in a deflationary period, now that means prices are actually coming down. We would all hope we're in a you know, deflationary period where all prices were coming down, but I think we're a ways from that. Nakata says some industries have seen recent price drops, real estate, used cars, and shipping topping the list. But after months of hearing about rising inflation, I asked Chaminade University. All of that considered, why is inflation easing now? What's to blame? One of the reasons for the easing is you know, mar markets are very fluid and markets work. Constricted supply chain points, they've figured that out. Businesses have figured out how to make themselves more efficient and how to, to work around the problem. So a lot of those supply chain issues have eased. A great sign for locals ahead of the holidays. Us being in the middle of the ocean and most things shipped here, that's, you know, a very positive thing for our state. Hopefully with this ease that it'll make it a little easier for people to go out and maybe purchase a gift. And though it's not a short-term solution, Shamanad says education will be key going forward. But those that are, are getting educated in jobs in data analytics and business analytics, uh, accounting, finance, fintech, those people are going to have jobs, and they're going to be good-paying jobs, and they're going to be ahead of the curve on inflation. Bryce Moore, KHON2 News, working for Hawaii.